All right, Mary Sue, um, we've admitted everyone from the lobby, so you're ready to go. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Sue Moreau. I'm the Director of Michigan Works Northeast Consortium, and I'd like to welcome you to today's panel discussion regarding reskilling and retraining in a post-COVID economy. This panel discussion is recorded and made available for those who are not able to attend today. Before we begin our discussion, let me introduce our panel members. Stephanie Beckhorn is the Director of the Office of Employment and Training for the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. In this role, Beckhorn works directly with federal state partners to provide the connections, drive continued business growth, build vibrant communities and attract and retain key talent to fill Michigan's vast pipeline of opportunities. Drawing upon her nearly 20 years of experience in workforce and economic development, she develops policies that align with and support of the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 324 Labor Management Education Committee. <laughs> Lee oversees and directs Operating Engineers 324's considerable outreach, considerable recruitment outreach, as well as many of their community improvement and volunteer efforts. He has been a strong advocate for pre-apprenticeship programs. Lee helps guide curriculum and project for several programs. He is also a tireless and subject matter expert for skilled trade apprenticeship, adhering to the U.S. Department of Labor registered apprenticeship model and regulation. Dave Goudreau is the president of Northern Wings, which was a startup company over 19 years ago in a pole barn in the middle of Michigan's Upper Peninsula with two employees. The company has grown to over 25 employees in a world-class operating facility in the Luce County Industrial Park with settled offices in three states. Northern Wings is engaged in manufacturing and supplying aviation parts, as well as managing repairs and providing maintenance program management services. David utilizes Michigan Works on-the-job training and incumbent worker training grants and the Going Pro Talent Fund to offer his employees training every year of the company's existence. Let's start today's discussion with a couple of questions for Leo's Deputy Director for Employment and Training, Stephanie Beckhorn. Stephanie, what impact has the COVID crisis had on the work the state does to implement key workforce and education programs? And what impacts do you see on funding for these programs by the federal government? Thanks, Mary Sue. I appreciate being here today. I guess, first of all, I'd, I'd like to just acknowledge, right, there's no playbook in really how to address what we have as, as a state have kind of come into contact with um, for the last five or six years, or five or six months, excuse me. Oh, Lord, let's, let's hope it's not that. Um, but I, I guess I really want to, I'm really proud of the team at LEO and really proud of the partners at Michigan Works because without a playbook in hand, really we stepped up to do whatever that we could to help um, meet the needs of job seekers and employers. And really how we did that in the, in the early stages of the pandemic um, was really just a lot of key uh, communication, just making sure that we were connected, um, that we understood the challenges that our partners were facing, whether it be the Michigan Works agencies, our adult education providers, our employers that we work with day in and day out, just kind of understanding their needs, meeting, sharing information, trying to get um, you know best practices out there and trying to hear what were those barriers and what are they that we could help them overcome. And so flexibility really, I think, became um, a key kind of tenant and that we were really focusing on. Um, you know, we, we, 
went and advocated with the governor's office and our congressional delegation for um, additional resources and dollars coming in to Michigan, understanding the huge um, challenge that businesses had to, to, had to endure over the last uh, few months is you know getting information out about the paycheck protection program ensuring businesses knew that there's those resources were there our work share program really to help um you know companies and, and job seekers who lost their job there was downsizing they were temporarily laid off to help get the word out to say you know there are programs to bring your workers back that can help offset some of the cost while you begin to build back um, you know a traditional production schedule or traditional hours of services um, we really had to get out to our providers that were meeting you know, with individuals, for example, our adult ed providers, no longer had the ability for students to walk into their classrooms, but to say, you know, what resources, what technology needs do you have? Are there software needs? And really connecting um, different groups from across the state who maybe were a little farther ahead or said this technology is working great for us. These are the challenges we're still having with this, you know, with this software or this program and really pulling groups together, trying to get the vendor to say, listen, as a state collectively vendor, here's what we're the challenges we're having. How can we um, ensure technology is meeting the needs of the job seekers? Um, right when the, when the economy shut down and, and individuals um, to, say, to, st to, to stay safe or staying home, you know, we had individuals that were relying on public assistance re resources, for example, and services from Michigan Works and from um, the state partners, but they didn't have the ability to go in person to, to meet those requirements. So we, um, again, standing up technology and really trying to say, how can we get the resources in the hands of individuals who are struggling right now to help um, themselves, to help their family? Um, we had to very quickly for businesses utilize technology. If we could no longer go into a plant in front of 100 individuals and talk about the services and share resources, we quickly moved those to online resources. Um, you know, taping them and sharing them so individuals could go back and re-listen to them and ensure that they knew what their next step is. Was their next step to call Michigan Works? What services could they get? As an employer, what services are out there to help me help my workers who are like family to me, right? And, and I want to make sure I'm protecting them. And so really communication became so critical. Um, and it was I can tell you, and Mary Sue, you know, because you participated in them, some of these were daily communications. We went to a meeting cadence of every single day. Sometimes it was twice, in the morning and then in the evening, just to address and try to, to, to get a catalog of all the barriers we're facing and systematically try to work through them to ensure our employers and our job seekers had the resources that they needed. You know, what we're doing now and, and still trying to move forward is, is during this whole time, employers, there were still employers out there who were hiring those essential workers, we employers who needed jobs filled. You know, we quickly stood up our Pure Michigan Talent Connect and put a, cop, a, a COVID jobs portal and said, hey, there are employers still hiring, allowing uh, residents in Michigan to search by geography, to search by the job title, to search by wages, and really showcasing the need so that those essential jobs, so that we could go to the grocery store, we could get access to food, our agricultural production facilities could still be maintaining. There was busing, there was healthcare and workers that were you know, still working for those of us who needed, uh, needed assistance. You know, with our virtual or with our vocational rehabilitation program, we had to very quickly adapt to much like our veterans and our migrant program at the state. These are hands on face to face services with our with our vocational rehabilitation uh, clients and to, to be able to have to, to swiftly switch over to another platform did have its challenges um, and was really uh, again, really proud of our counselors who every day calling in to their voc rehab client. What's, is everything okay? Are you getting food? Do you have access to medical care? So the scope of the work was much more than just workforce development. It was also that 
personal touch, that connection point where I think people felt really unconnected and, you know, just again, to meet all those demands. But we're still continuing to work because the need is still out there. So we've gone to the federal government. We've asked for flexibility in our, in our programs. Can our grants program periods be extended so we have longer periods of time to spend the dollars with the significant shutdown for multiple weeks, right? Some expenditures slowed down a little bit, but we know the need is there and it's just going to get greater and greater as we slowly start to open back up and people slowly start feeling more comfortable and are ready to re-engage. So we asked for that flexibility. You know, we got additional flexibility for administrative dollars because we understood and knew that there were demands for you know PPE equipment, new technology as we you know as I briefly mentioned how what a significant role technology has you know has played here. And so I think just really coming together, being flexible. Um, another great example is virtual job fairs, right? The job fair that we may have been used to five or six months ago is just not feasible at this point. So we've got a statewide platform that the Michigan Works agencies are using. And as many resources to tap into to meet the demands of our job seekers. But then also what flexibilities can we get from the, from the government to expend these dollars? We have the CARES Act dollars. We've successfully obtained over the summer additional dollars to address apprenticeships, to address work-based learning. But we continue to, to push the federal government to say the CARES Act dollars are fantastic, but we need more flexibility. We need additional resources and dollars for workforce, for education for our local and regional um, communities for their infrastructure cost. And so the job's not done, right? We continue each day to be an advocate for our job seekers and for our employers. But it really, the success that we've had in Michigan is really because of strong partnerships and everybody rolling up their sleeves, pitching in and saying, what can we do today? How can we help to meet the needs of our communities? Thank you, Stephanie. And I apologize for my um, sign up, but that's one of the things we're trying to address in all this is broadband and Reaching out to, to um, help with the federal programs has been greatly appreciated, and you know, we like the communication like that is so important. So the next question is for as you know, there is a growing need for retraining of workers due to the huge number of jobs lost during the COVID-19 crisis. What role do you think going program and fund could play in that need, and what can you do to going pro talent fund monies included in the fiscal year 2021 state budget. Well, I think as most people are aware, if you, if you've, if you know what the going pro talent fund is, um, you're probably aware of how highly successful the program is. So the data uh, over the last few years since the program's been in existence really really demonstrates um, you know, how successful the program is. So for those of you who aren't aware, the Going Pro Talent Fund is a um, uh, in-demand short-term training program that really is a strong partnership between Michigan Works, the state, labor, the legislature, and, and really employers to meet their demand. And it's very nimble, very flexible, um, not a lot of, uh, you know, government bureaucracy forms and documentations. Certainly, yes, there is an expectation to show outcomes for the dollars used because these are state resources, um, but very nimble uh, program that can meet, again, 
in-demand short-term training that a business is facing, right? It's preventing them from expanding, taking on new production lines, um, diversifying their portfolio. And so again, highly, highly successful, lots of investment on the employer's part in kind, allowing um, their employees to train while on the job providing a space for the training, even providing sometimes the equipment for the training. So very uh, successful program. And, you know, Mary Sue, I think going pro obviously, um, we hope is, you know, along for a long, for a long time and really can help meet that demand to ensure that employers have access to a skilled workforce and that employers are actively engaged in the training process, right? They help identify the needs, they work with, the the educational entity to ensure it's it's really meaningful training and that the individual is very productive at the end of the training so um kind of where we're at if i kind of level set today for the fiscal year that begins um october 1st so that's our we refer to as a fiscal year 21 budget um there's there's approximately 28 million dollars that has been identified in a line item for the going pro talent fund now, with that being said, right, the, the reality is, is that it's going to be a very tough budget for fiscal year 21. Um, I think a key kind of next step is um, kind of unprecedented, but, but there's a special August revenue sharing conference next week. And I think it'll really provide up-to-date information on um, revenue that's come in and where the state is ultimately at. I think it'll help paint a truer picture to say, what is the gap or what is the hole as, a, as the state of Michigan that we're trying to fill in regards to our state budget. So having that additional information, I think, will give us a little clearer picture on how the 21 budget will play out. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, you know, hopeful that we can, um, you know, get some positive revenue coming in and that those numbers are maybe better than what folks have The CARES Act, um, certainly there's dollars there for the state, but very restrictive and additional flexibility and quite frankly, additional resources from Congress to support kind of those key components I mentioned under the last question, you know, education, infrastructure, regional and local government work, and of course, workforce development. Um, I think those are all part of the, the gap too to help meet that employer demand. Um, for the system and for our key partners for industry and for labor, um, I would just, you know, ask to continue, you know, continue for your strong advocacy of the program. I think the return on investment and the data really shows that um, Going Pro Talent Fund um, helps individuals with good jobs. It helps strengthen their career path. They earn um, and learn more skills. It moves them up the career ladder. So, um, you know, continue to advocate for the program. We're certainly advocating on our part, but we're also facing the reality of the budget. So we're looking for additional flexibility and additional resources from Congress to kind of supplement our, um, you know, existing programs and where our budget has challenges. Um, and fortunately, in addition to going pro, you know, there are some other federally funded resources that can serve similar functions as going pro including um, customized short-term training and apprenticeship programs. And that's resources through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which supports incumbent worker training, on-the-job training. And I would just encourage individuals that are participating today to reach out to your local Michigan Works Agency's uh, business service team or um, the employment training, my team's talent, talent development liaisons and so that we can really have individuals in um, your region really talk to you and explore all the training resources that are available right now to assist you with your talent needs. And I'm glad to hear that the Going Pro at least has a place marker and a budget item in the new New budget, so that's um, encouraging. So we thank you for that. Now let's turn to Lee Graham from Opera.
reporting injury 24 for the next two questions. So the first question is, as a newly appointed member of the Governor's Workforce Development Board, how do you think the board will be able to assist in the economic recovery post COVID? Mary Sue, thank you. I'm super honored to be on this uh, panel today, uh, working with the private sector, uh, the state organizations with LEO, Michigan Works. Um, happy to be able to uh, share uh, the opportunities that we have before us. We continue to come together as workforce development. We talked about the boards, we talk about Michigan Works Agency across the state, uh, the professional trades, our employers, uh, and all the good work that's ahead of us. So in these times right now, the governor has a great interest and desire in the optimis optimize workforce development opportunities. You know, these are challenging times, but they don't have to be desperate times. You know, that's what we've been saying. By putting together leaders that represent not only business, but also labor and government leaders, you know, we can really focus on the things that are important. We see it every day at OE324. It takes a partnership and employers want to know, you know, they are working, doing, you know, everything that needs to be carried out in the most well-trained, qualified workers that are available. The more efficient we are, the more efficient they are. So um, we work with them, we identify their needs, and we translate it you know, into you know, what we're teaching. You know, this is a model that is acceptable statewide. Efficiencies are growing you know, to become important as we build back up. And the best way to find these efficiencies are in conversations between these groups. That is why the governor with the development of this board is looking to facilitate uh, we, we can work together to identify what has been working and sometimes what hasn't and recommend changes, you know, so that our businesses can have the best chance um, of success with well-trained workforce. You know, we, we know Michigan has the talent. We're taking in the next step to make sure that success is certain. Is certain. So we're looking forward to Operating Engineers 324 offers an extensive apprenticeship program featuring three training career centers. Why are apprenticeships important, important and how could they assist with turning the economy around? Thank you, Mary Sue. Uh, apprenticeships are often the foundation of long, rewarding, sustainable careers. They provide both the knowledge base that prepares someone for the challenges you know, in their chosen field, you know, that, that offers, you know, as well as hone the essential skills that translate into work and life. Uh, in the professional trades, professional skill trades, you know, we go a step further. Our apprenticeships are registered with the US DOL Office of Apprenticeship. They're registered to meet highly developed standards, federal standards, and ensure that our apprentices have the skills that translate even our state, but meet rigid national uh, wide guidelines. When someone enters our apprenticeship, they earn and learn. That's what we've said, right? No accumulation of debt. So these are great careers. And then we say too, you know, let's look at our infrastructure, our cities, our states, our counties, uh, our country. We know that there's great work to be done, the roads, the bridges to be rebuilt, new energy structures, the hospitals, the schools, a lot of good work that's ahead of us across the state. Um, that's what we say, there's much work to be done. So we're taking and pairing the workforce that is well educated in these registered apprenticeship programs with a serious need. We have to rebuild infrastructure in a way that we've not seen in 70 plus years. So that means the opportunities that are here and in turn in our industry and our sector can become one of the driving forces, you know, propelling the economy forward. Uh, we've been excited about some of the most recent pre-apprenticeships that we've been able to uh, keep during this uh, COVID transition, you know, to be able to, like we talked about the virtual platform and and being able to make sure that the training directors and the trade a bit too with this falling upon us on the virtual side, uh, it's just given us more uh, traction in the future uh, to be able to share different platforms. Uh, but the work uh, keeps moving forward and we've been excited uh, to keep that part going. So thank you. Thank you, Lee.
And I'm, I'm glad to hear some positives on COVID instead of uh, negatives. So that's great that you're utilizing the, the positives forward. So we'll now turn to David Goudreau from Northern on the job training opportunities and have received Going Pro Talent Fund monies in the past to fund training. What are the top issues you see employers facing in a post-COVID economy and how can employers best address these issues? Well, good morning, Mary Sue. It's uh, a pretty august body here with Lee and uh, Stephanie. Um, we'll kind of get to your question all, real quick here. The first thing we did is as a small business located in a rural area, and that's my perspective, is we looked at, at, at being perhaps one bad day away from destruction, right? So when you, we use the term post COVID economy, we kind of had to remind ourselves it's the same economy we had before COVID came um, with some minor changes. In other words, uh, simply put, doctors are going to still be doctors when this is gone. Lawyers will still be lawyers. These guys will still be operating equipment only at a far faster rate because of the impingements that have been placed on the system. So the same folks that are kind of left in the breach is, is, is the same strata of folks that Michigan works toil so hard to try and get up a few rungs on the ladder. But I think it's going to be a little more difficult now for, for Michigan Works to do so because now you're going to have to do this with, with what looks to be less money. So when I say that, um, two legislatures had the misfortune of stopping by here to visit us last week and we ended up into a two-hour conversation. And um, there's a rather vulgar description about the budget process for 2021. Um, it, it's, it's a disaster and it's going to be... It's going to be an interesting path, if you will, but I think the future is hinged upon the funding of certain things such as workforce development and job placement. So we'll talk a little bit about what do you, what do you, what, what problems do small businesses or businesses in general have in the post COVID economy. And oddly enough, as I said, when we looked at that, it's the same economy. And once again, it's the same problems, the exact same problems, a qualified, Sober drug-free workforce, right? We're gonna be facing taxes, fuel increases potentially, and regulations. Those are the things we need to be uh, ready to, to attack, if you will, or look at, and, and it isn't any one of those issues, it's the uncertainty that comes with each of those issues after getting a one-two blow from, from the shutdown and any ill employees. So it's gonna be really difficult, right? And I think, I think what's gonna be difficult, what, we, we have a large amount of, or a large percentage of unemployed now, but to get them back to work, to conceivably work for less than they did before because of the unemployment supplement is gonna be a difficulty. I'm, I'm not making any measure of a moral judgment. I'm saying you gave them a value judgment. The case in point, if you had me a contract with me to manufacture some aircraft parts and you offered to pay me more if I didn't make them, I would certainly take that immediately, right? So I, I, I think what we need most is the Going Pro Talent Fund and to continue to fund Michigan Works to work an even larger group of people who are going to be seeking employment. Not necessarily rosy because of the budget picture, but uh, that's the way it is. Thanks. Dave, I couldn't agree more with the training and the, the funding. I think you're absolutely right, and that's what the needs are, have been and are going to continue to be. And of course, the always important drug-free, sober workforce. So the next question is for the entire panel. If we can keep it to the same order, so Stephanie, Lee, and Dave. The question is, while we don't yet know what the post-COVID-19 economy is going to look like, we do know well, there will be a lot of Michigan residents who will not be returning to the jobs they had before COVID hit. Michigan Works is poised and ready to assist both job seekers and employers as the economy recovers. How do you see us working with partners across the state, across the state, to get our economy up and running again? So again, we'll
recover and adjust to the new economic reality that has resulted from COVID, um, you know, certainly echoing, um, you know, some of Dave's comments to say those, you know, the, the, the challenges are there. Some, some were pre-COVID, some are as a result of COVID, but to continue to reach out um, the value of addressing uh, industry and sector partnership where there's uh, shared needs, shared concerns, and also, and really importantly, shared best practices and shared learned lessons, um, I think is, is really valuable for the system to continue and engage with. Of course, um, increasing you know, business services to support the education and funding um, to really support digital and technology infrastructure for small business customers. Um, customers who wear, you know, one person wears five hats. Um, you know, how can they become more lean? How can they become more efficient? Um, what resources and services can Michigan work serve as an extension of that small business to get them back up on their feet, to have them grow even stronger, better, diversify more? Um, you know, long post COVID, uh, you know, I think our delivery model of how we deliver services are, is forever changed. And I think technology, and virtual services are just gonna become um, more common and to really help out those, those sectors of our business who aren't real familiar with them or do not have the, the resources or the means right now to continue to help and serve them so that uh, small business continues to, to grow and expand in our state and, and hope to, again, not only get back to pre-COVID but even uh, greater strength numbers and growth in our state. Um, um, I really uh, think it's important to continue to support and expand career pathways. We need to ensure that our work, Michigan workforce is upskilled, um, that they have the, the, the skills for high demand, high wage uh, jobs of not only today or tomorrow. Um, I think we really need to, as a system, prioritize training um, that builds in skills that are COVID proof, if you will, um, to facilitate really that swift, swift transfer from workers who their pre-COVID careers or pre-COVID pre opportunities and skill sets are no longer viable to help them get the new post-COVID uh, skills. Um, you know, and, and everything that I've mentioned at this point is really leading to, right, it's, if, it, it leads to increase in the educational attainment level of Michiganders. Um, which ultimately then helps our, our workforce. And so would ask that Michigan Works and the other partners on the phone here really support um, the, the governor's 60 by 30 initiative, um, which is uh, to increase the educational attainment uh, level of Michigan's workforce from 45% to 60% by the year 2030. Now we've, um, in a little over a year since we've launched this initiative, we're, we're up to almost 49%. But we need to continue to push, um, you know, push that number and stretch that goal because an educated Michigan workforce um, that meets employers' needs is a more resilient workforce that's better prepared to meet uh, whatever future change, you know, future challenges lie in front of us. Uh, whether it be, you know, like a pandemic or an economic downturn, we we know uh, a lot. Uh, right, a lot of cyclical things happen in our economy and everything that we can do to ensure our Michigan workforce is resilient, um, that they're on a career path, that the skills that they're learning are skills that will carry them throughout their career. Yes, lifelong learning will be part of that, um, but to position our workforce into one that's um, very uh, COVID proof, if you will, or any other like downturn in the economy is really where I would say Michigan Works has played a role and will uh, need to continue to play a really strong role to make it a Michigan that's uh, you know prosperous for, for everyone, for, for all employers and job seekers. Very well said, Stephanie. Uh, Lee Graham here, just uh, wanna answer the question as well. And, like Stephanie said, I think this is our strongest time. It, it, it does make us stronger. The workforce boards, the Michigan Works Agencies, uh, the Jobs for Michigan graduates. I want to give some shout outs to those organizations because we've been able to keep um, some of our pre-apprenticeships still running through this COVID piece. And we've been able to do that virtually, obviously, through Zoom, like today's format. 
But what's been really special when we have the professional trades, you know, seeking the opportunities and showcasing the opportunities for not only the students uh, in these pre-apprenticeship programs, the uh, K-12 initiative with 11th and 12th graders, and also the adult um, opportunities with access for all, whether it be in Battle Creek or Kalamazoo or Detroit, um, we've continued this along. And so the trades right now, you know, just as before, we continue to ramp up our opportunities with the My Career Quest that we're in the past, you know, we're looking to go virtual now, but we have not slowed down because we even more now than ever, throughout these weeks to be able to see uh, what, what the professional trades would be like and, and, and how they uh, combine the related training and the on-the-job training with our employers and our partners. So uh, special programs uh, during these times. And like I said, I just want to give a shout out because um, you know these are the opportunities that we have. We continue to grow. We have this coming Thursday, we have a graduation ceremony. So it's uh, similar to what they've been doing in the format with the drive-in theaters, you know, and the, recognizing the students for their uh, seniors graduating and all that. So they're gonna pull in the parking lot down at the operators and we're partnering with our employers and, and all of the trades. And like I mentioned, uh, uh, DSC and, and Jobs for Michigan graduate, guess what? We're still gonna have a graduation. So we're doing that this Thursday. Uh, the governor is gonna do a pre-recorded piece and so is Adam Ollier, uh, the Senator out of Detroit. And, and we're actually gonna, you know, end up being able to give tools for their startup. These are students that are graduating, uh, 11th to 12th graders to step up into the professional trade. So the good work that's gone on through, you know, March all the way up forward, um, these are platforms that we can share like today on these panels uh, to make sure that when we have good templates, we share these good templates across the state, like we said, whether it's Battle Creek or Kalamazoo or Detroit, uh, when it talks about pre-apprenticeships that lead up into registered apprentices. So um, exciting, you know, so we keep on moving and uh, um, yes, we've had some challenging times, but you know, we, we've even looked with our employers, you know, they do these, um, you know, obviously drone footages when, you know, when, when, we're, when we weren't able to take these students out on the projects and the time-lapse videos of, you know, a hospital being built uh, or, or different infrastructure across the state. So we've really taxied ourselves over these, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks uh, and still wanted to bring them something that still would, you know, wow them, you know, and want them to um, actually look at our industry and say, you know, how can we do this? So transitioning um, the pre-apprenticeships, the opportunities to register apprenticeships. Uh, we find every single year that we get closer with all our partners that Stephanie had mentioned as well too, whether it's the MySTEM and it's the Jobs for Michigan grads and the Office of Apprenticeship and our employers. So uh, this Thursday, we're gonna showcase, right? We're gonna actually put a, a safety vest on that has the operating engineers on it and a hat of one of our employers. It's just like getting a chance to go on to uh, your college, right? So you're actually doing a signing day uh, so we're still making sure that, um, you know, we're showcasing our industry and, and uh, showing them how professional it really can be. So thank you. Uh, a, a couple of things. Um, what does the age limit leave for a fella, just an average Joe such as myself, to sign up for the pre-apprenticeship program? If this Hey, we, we would love to have you. Guess what? Because... Like three years ago, we had a graduate that graduate uh, age of 62, top of their class. So I'm telling you, I'm not saying that's around your age, but the truth of the matter is uh, it's, it's wide open. We have a wide range uh, because like we talked about earlier, you know, individuals transitioning out of, you know, uh, other careers, they have skills, right? They have different skills that they would apply to our sector. And this particular individual was a machinist. And this machinist was very precise about a lot of things and every employer we sent them to, they didn't want to let them go. So, <laughs> so the age limit, there you go. You got your answer. Perfect. Thanks. Um, to answer, I guess the question was posed to everybody is that whether we like it or not, it's, it's important that we realize we are rapidly moving to a world of certifications and documented qualifications. Don't believe me? Ask Lee what happens when somebody's, you know, you have an incident or whatever the case. The immediate research is into the qualifications. 
So it kind of focuses back on, well, what does Michigan Works and partners need to do? Well, Michigan Works, and, and I think uh, if Stephanie's listening, the, the Going Pro Talent Fund is kind of the answer to that pursuit. Um, and as far as it relates to small business, I would contend that small business can't just sustain, it's got to grow and build. And in order to do that, you've got to build your bench. Michigan Works and the Going Pro Talent Fund along with a few of the other programs, do exactly that to allow the, the, the business to flourish. And I think the last part of what Michigan Works is doing, and I think it's kind of missed here, is that when you pay for an employee to take any particular training, he gets the certification, we always reference the employer. Well, the employer really doesn't get the certification, right? It's the employee who does. So you're building like Lee does, you're building a better citizen, right? He takes those qualifications and he can go anywhere in the country to work, to build, to do whatever he needs. And, and, and I, I fall back on the only real agency within the Michigan system is Michigan Works. And so um, if you think we had to work a little bit harder before, imagine post COVID now climbing out of this hole with limited money, limited assets, it's time to get ingenious because we're gonna to have to put some folks to work, get this economy going, and get back to some degree of normalcy, please. Great discussion. Thank you to all members for the great discussion today. Uh, do any of you have any final thoughts you would like to share? I'm going to put a shout out for the Michigan Works uh, conference that's coming up. So we had our Massey meeting on Monday and we continue to talk about, uh, I was telling Luann earlier just uh, on the previous call that we had just how amazing uh, last year's uh, conference was. Uh, I attended one, you know, two years prior to that, but talk about bringing people together. So um, that's, that would be uh, our shout out uh, and say thank you for what you do. Um, having the chance to uh, sit on the workforce boards, uh, like Stephanie said earlier, uh, back to Leo, back to the state, back to uh, how the workforce boards, or I should say the Michigan Works Agencies, uh, were able to continue to lift up and um, really help individuals during the times that we're in right now. So um, we got to hear that. Uh, we got to see some of the videos they put together. So when you see the videos, if you haven't seen them yet, you want to go back and look at them because you can truly appreciate the staff and how everybody has worked together. Um, to uh, make this, you know, the best it can be. So that would be my shout out back, last closing comments. And Mary Sue, I guess just one final comment um, from, my, from my perspective, and it really ties in, I think, uh, you know, the common theme that Lee and Dave and I, you know, really just talked about as far as the ensuring our workforce has the skills that they need to succeed and meet employer demand. Um, you know, another initiative, and for those who um, participated last week in the event um, that Jacob Moss um, hosted, um, really was the futures for frontliners was discussed. And so um, if, if you participated, you heard a little bit about that. If you haven't, I think those are recorded so you could go back and listen to that. But that's just another opportunity, um, a governor's initiative that um, really is a thank you, first and foremost, a thank you to those essential workers who, while the majority of us stayed home and, and to stay safe, they each day went out um, and went to the clinic, went to the grocery store, uh, drove the local bus years at a community college or an industry uh, recognized credential. Um, and then it also supports those uh, uh, essential workers, those frontliners who lack a high school diploma, it allows them to get their high school completion and to get then an industry recognized credential or a two year degree. Um, and again, it's, it's, it just goes back to say, um, you know, help upskill the, those workers, get them on to a successful career path where the sky's the limit um, in those high demand, high wage jobs. And most importantly, 
learning the skills um, that employers need so that our economy here in Michigan continues to grow. So uh, specific um, information regarding the kickoff of that event and the Um, thanks, Mary Sue. Appreciate the opportunity today. Um, we actually had one question in the chat. Dave, did you have another question? Have you guys an answer before we close out? Um, did any of the CTE programs get CARE Act dollars? Um, I don't know, Dave, do you want to take that question? I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll take that question. That that's that's my I, that's mine. Um, so uh, good question. Uh, I'll say sort of it would be the answer. So um, in in my world in in Leo um, employment and training, um, my team oversees the post secondary CTE programs. Um, so secondary CTE programs are administered through the Department of Education. And so the post-secondary um, CTE is, is delivered through employment training. So I'm gonna stay in my lane and, and respond to that component. So for the post-secondary Perkins, my sort of response is kind of what I talked about in the very first question when Mary Sue asked, you know, how have you adapted to COVID? How are things different? Um, we pushed really hard at the federal level to the U.S. Department of Education and said for our uh, post-secondary CTE dollars, which are Perkins, um, you know, we really, those dollars, you know, expire in, a, in another month and a half here, but the reality is, right, with schools, um, post-secondary schools shutting down, um, we know the need is still great, but our expenditures may have dropped off a little bit. So we were successful in getting petitioning and saying, please don't take those dollars, um, you know, at the end of the fiscal year that we haven't expended. The need is there. The need is great. And so we were successful in getting an additional time period to spend those dollars because we know um, they're very much needed and the uncertainty of not only the Michigan budget like we talked about today, but quite frankly, the federal budget um, that we want to hang on to any resources that are already in our in our uh, world of purview to, to try to keep them as long as we can so because the demand is so great. So that's that component of it. And then I would say looking ahead um, for uh, the CTE programs, we uh, are submitting a reimagining workforce preparation grant. Um, and that's a grant administered by the Department of the U.S. Department of Education, really in that CTE world. Um, and so we are going to be submitting um, a request for uh, dollars coming into the state so that we can grow and expand CTE programs all in line with what we've already said today. In-demand programs, employers have needs, there's a strong career pathway, good wage jobs that allow an individual to support themselves and their family. So those dollars, um, those grants aren't due to the end of the month here. And if I had to guess on a typical federal grant cycle, you know, we're probably late fall before we hear if we're successful. Um, but if, if we're going to say, right, we are successful. We've had some great luck this summer, particularly with that team doing a really good job. I know a lot of you potentially even on this call have reached out offering your support. Um, Lee, as a board member, some of his other uh, board members have reached out and said, hey, I'm going to support. What can I do? How can I ensure Michigan brings in these dollars to better prepare our, uh, um, you know, our workforce? So we thank you for that. And we'll probably continue to reach out and engage um, to, to ensure that the Michigan application is the strongest that it can be. And then, of course, if we got the dollars, we will, um, you know, be pushing out and sharing how local entities can tap into those dollars to um, really help regionally grow the skills of their workforce. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. So I'd like to thank our panel members for their time and sharing their knowledge and thoughts with us today. Mitch is proud to work with you to help get Michigan residents reemployed post-COVID and finding employers the talent they need to re-engage as the economy recovers. 
Thank you for everyone for joining us today for this informative discussion and have a great day. Take care, everybody. Nice to meet you, Lee. Yes, pleasure meeting you, Dave. Look forward to 